across the fence, we'll explore a current exhibit at the Fleming Museum. As you're about to see, it's an exhibit where more where is less. Also today, right we'll now. learn why a University of Vermont and professor and is careful to protect the contents of these cabinets. Specimens. We'll open the gateway to uh, the largest here, Vermont flora collection uh, in the world. So we'll Good afternoon and thanks for joining us. I'm Judy Simpson. One of the best known secrets at the University of Vermont is the Pringle Herbarium. The herbarium is a fully functional collection of more than 300,000 specimens of dried plants. What's so significant about dried plants and what makes UVM's Pringle Herbarium so important? Across the fences, Rebecca Gollin has the story. Wes Testo doesn't have time to stop and smell the flowers. He's too busy collecting them. You ideally want not just leaves, but either flowers or fertile leaves if it's a fern, which I often work with, or fruits, often bark of a tree, something like that. Additional characters that can really help you identify it and would also be useful to someone, you know, 50 or 100 years down the road who come and look at this plant, because these specimens, you know, outlast the people who collect them. Testo takes detailed notes about how and where the plant is growing and arranges it in his press. Drying plants as quickly as possible is key to keeping their color and preventing rot. You flatten the whole plant out, um, but you need to do so in a way that presents all of the possible important features of the plant. So you want the flowers to be presented, um, the roots, if you're collecting the roots, to be presented. Um, both sides of leaves, so people can see the undersides and the top sides of leaves. Testo will contribute his findings to one of the largest collections of dried plants in New England, which is located at the University of Vermont. The first person we know about who collected plants, who was connected with the University of Vermont, was a man named Joseph Torrey, who coincidentally also got his name on the building we're in. Dave Barrington is a professor of plant biology at UVM and the curator of the Pringle Herbarium, which is home to over 300,000 specimens of preserved plants. And the primary goal of having the collection is to provide a basis for research into biodiversity, conservation of that diversity, and then various studies of what we call systematic biology, which is understanding kinds of plants and animals, the way they originated through the evolutionary process. While Tori's collection of plants from the 1840s marks the start of the herbarium, what really galvanized the collection was the acquisition of the private herbarium of Charlotte Cyrus Pringle in 1902. And Cyrus is perhaps the most colorful person in the history of the collection. At the time that his collection came to the university, he had in his own house in Charlotte, about 50,000 specimens. We're in the fern part of the collection right now, and I open it up, and what I've got here is something like a couple of thousand specimens, each in their folders. The collection here grows through gifts and acquisitions of smaller herbaria, as well as trading duplicates of specimens with other institutions. We have some really exotic trading relationships. We have trading relationships with a group in northeastern Brazil, uh, Taiwan, uh, Indonesia, uh, a couple of places in Europe, um, the herbarium in Denmark trades us Greenland specimens, and we trade with herbaria here and there across the United States as well. In addition, the Pringle relies on botany enthusiasts to help grow and round out their collection of local plants. Barrington says those collectors include conservationists and hobbyists, as well as students like Testo, who's working towards a PhD in plant biology. I do a lot of collecting for the herbarium, um, so I started that pretty seriously a little over a year ago when I moved to Vermont. Um, and so I go out in the field quite frequently and collect plants mostly for my own research. So ferns that I am studying, I collect those, um, take a leaf or a whole plant, press it and dry it, um, and deposit those in the herbarium for my own study. But I also am um, broadly interested in the plants that we have here in Vermont. So I collect a lot of those as well, try to learn to identify them. Herbaria collections not only document the plant life within a geographic area, but also help researchers identify the arrival of invasive species. When you collect a plant, you include the date on when you collected it. 
For example, Japanese knotweed is a really prominent weed that we have in the state. That wasn't here 50 years ago. Now it's all over our roadsides. Um, so if you go to an herbarium and start to look at collections, you can start to kind of infer when this plant showed up on the scene here. So it looks After the plants dry, Testa will hand them over to the Pringle, um, where they will eventually be mounted. When they are, there's a good chance that it will be done by Hilda White. Newspaper over it. And the plants come from all over the world. This plant is from Italy. We have a collector who's collected a lot from Australia and Illinois and everywhere. And we have a, many Vermont collectors, so our collection of Vermont plants is outstanding. White has been a volunteer at the Pringle nice since 1998. She's mounted over 30,000 plants for the collection. What is it that makes a good specimen? Well, see this one? It has flowers and roots, and it's pressed nicely so that it, it shows up properly. The, uh, the flowers, the reproductive parts always have to be up so that a scientist that's examining this later can tell what's, what it is. And um, they need to be dried fresh and properly. If they're not dried properly, they come out black instead of green. Like many who volunteer or spend time working at the Pringle, White is also an avid plant collector. Her passion is mosses. Every year I go out to one or two towns and collect mosses. I've gone mostly to towns that have not been recorded very much because we really didn't know whether something was rare or not just because nobody collected it. And, and so for entertainment in the wintertime, I identify these mosses that I, that I collect. Once the specimens are mounted, they're filed into the large cabinets that hold the collection. As those cabinets are organized by botanical family in evolutionary order, proper filing is a task that might require a degree in botany just to figure out. So this is one specimen, and this is what we have 300,000 of. Uh, as long as we can keep the insects from eating it and fire from burning it, uh, storage is indefinite. We have specimens in European herbaria that are now 600 years old, and they're fine. You see these plants every day. It's nice to be able to know what the difference is between an oak tree and a maple tree, or between all the different kinds of maples that we have. But you really start to get a grasp for the diversity around you. Um, so instead of just seeing a whole bunch of green around you, you start to see different grasses and plantains and asters and wild impatiens growing. The Pringle Herbarium continues to grow and expand an old-fashioned catalog of the world around us that remains relevant in our modern times. In Burlington, I'm Rebecca Gollin with Across the Fence. Efforts to digitize the herbarium's specimens and data are ongoing. A significant portion of the collection are already part of an online database. Our next story takes us to a building just a stone's throw from the herbarium. The university's Fleming Museum is welcoming a new series of changing exhibits. Across the Fences, Keith Silva tells us about an art exhibit called On Drawing. Swirls, splotches, and a simple pencil line in the form of an L make Dorothy and Herb Bogle On Drawing one of the most demanding exhibitions to hang in the galleries of the University of Vermont's Fleming Museum. Janie Cohen is the museum's director. It, it's challenging in that the work is um, primarily minimalist and some conceptual work, not exclusively, but there is a lot of that in this show. Um, and just to, you know, to explain that very briefly, conceptualism is just what it sounds like, the concept is the work. So it's more about the idea than it is about what's actually on the paper. 
Minimalism is, again, is pretty self-explanatory. It arose in the 1970s, late 60s and 70s, in response to the abstract expressionist movement, and it could not be more different from that. Um, artists were really experimenting with the essence of a certain medium or a, you know, a certain genre. So what is the minimum that I can do as an artist um, that will have meaning as an artwork? And there were you know, a number of strategies and ways of approaching this that you'll see in this exhibition. Abstractions of abstractions and concepts of ideas play well in an artist's imagination. On paper, on drawing is still a challenge. Take, for instance, these watercolors by Richard Tuttle. What you see are, are just a few watercolor brush strokes on a piece of lined notebook paper. The paper or the surface on which he and other artists were drawing or painting watercolor was as important as what they were putting on it. So, you know, you could come in and say, look, these are just, you know, squiggles on old paper. But um, the way he did it, it creates this object. So you realize, if you look at it closely, you're not looking at an image. You are looking at an object, which is this kind of delicate, vulnerable old piece of, of notebook paper that's wrinkled now because of the watercolor on it and it really becomes it becomes almost three-dimensional so it is is this object by making that wash or watercolor drawing he changes the surface he creates a thing take the time to look and Tuttle's watercolors elicit a meditative and hypnotic quality another of Tuttle's pieces shows minimalism at its most minimal he, for a period of time, every day, would create a graphic mark on, um, you know, with a, with a pencil on a piece of paper on a, on a, in a, a large notebook. This one is in L form and is very close to the bottom of the paper. So again, the paper itself becomes part of the, of the medium, part of the, of the statement it makes and part of the object itself. You're as or more aware of the paper as you are of the line. It can be interpreted in any ways. He called it L, it's an L. It also looks kind of like an architectural suggestion of architecture. You know, it could be a, a pathway. So it, you know, it allows you enormous amount of space to kind of project into it. Um, you know, what you see, what you feel, what you, you know, what you want from it. It could be irritation, <laughs> um, you know, it could be excitement, it could be, you know, an understanding that this was part of an artistic practice. The exhibition bears the names of Dorothy and Herb Vogel. If the art in this show seems odd and difficult to grasp, the Vogels themselves were the exact opposite. They were very non-art world people, but they became a huge force in the art world. She was a librarian and he was a mail sorter for the U.S. Postal Service. Um, they were both artists themselves and they met and they began collecting and soon realized they, that they enjoyed collecting more than making art and they were better collectors than artists themselves. So um, on on her salary, they purchased art by then unknown artists or, you know, just emerging artists. Um, and over a period of decades put together a very, very important, significant collection of art from the, basically from the 60s to the 90s, um, you know, that focused heavily initially on conceptual and minimal, um, and then moved into post-minimal, and was really a, a, a snapshot of the time in which they were collecting. In their lifetime, the Vogels collected over 4,000 works of art. In 2008, with assistance from the National Gallery of Art, the Vogels created a plan to distribute 50 objects in their collection to one museum in each of the 50 states. The Fleming Museum of Art was chosen as Vermont's recipient of this generous gift. For us, it fills in areas in 20th century art history that the Fleming really didn't have good, you know, good representation. So, you know, we're able to talk about minimalism and conceptual art in, in a way that we couldn't before. For Cohen, the joy the Vogels showed towards art, artists, and collecting comes out in the show. She hopes this enthusiasm rubs off on visitors who, at first, might be turned off.
these things which are very challenging that people may come in and initially say what is this my child could do this um, you know might leave with a with a different understanding or you know begin to mold these things over and just think about it looks like nothing to us but it was radical at the time really radical this was the beginning of some of these ideas that are now very entrenched Dorothy and Herb Vogel on drawing demonstrates even at its minimal best art always inspires. In Burlington, I'm Keith Silva with Across the Fence. For more information on current or upcoming exhibits at the Fleming, check the museum's website. The address is flemingmuseum.org or you can call the number is 802-656-2090. And that's our program for today. Thanks for joining us. I'm Judy Simpson. I'll see you again next time on Across the Fence.